1999, Power Man 5000 released the absolute banger when worlds collide, a song you might have heard on repeat whilst kick-flipping your way to glory in Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2, and that is, I know, one of the weirdest opening paragraphs you're ever going to hear in one of my videos. And making worlds collide is something that's been going on for a few years now. Freddy vs Jason, Batman vs Superman, Alien vs Predator, and now Greg's vs Primark. But what if I told you that this also happened in racing? Well it did! In the 1950s, when the Automobile Club of Italy decided it was going to hold an exhibition race to see what would happen if you put IndyCar teams against Formula 1 teams at the famous Monza Oval. Now, as a disclaimer, I'd love to show pictures from the actual events, but as you've probably gathered by now, there are limits to what I can and can't use because of copyright and stuff. I basically have to use public domain images, copyright-free images, or you know, Creative Commons images. And I do have access to a library of photographs now that the Patreon money will use to get access to and things like that, but there aren't any pictures besides one on that library that I can use. And even then, it's on Wikipedia. So before people get annoyed that I didn't show anything from the actual race or I showed the wrong car, I'm very limited in what I can and can't use. And I will try my best to find pictures of the cars that got used, the drivers that took part and things like that, pictures of the Monza Oval in you know the olden days and things like that, but I got stung about a year and a half ago for copyright and it's not something I'm going through again, so I'm just going to play by the rules and if that upsets people then I'm truly sorry, my hands are tied. So yeah, I mean, Goodwood did do a good article on the race, that's got a lot of colour images that you can use, I'll leave a link to that in the description, but yeah, moving on. Monza is the third purpose-built racetrack ever to be constructed, being built after Brooklands, which was the first, and Indianapolis. So it was the third purpose-built racetrack in the world, the second purpose-built racetrack to be built in Europe, but it's the oldest in Europe still in use. Built in 1922, it incorporated a 3.4 mile boot-shaped road course and a 2.8 mile oval that could be used separately or combined to create one of the fastest racetracks in the world, and really push what a car could do in a straight line. But in 1928, a serious accident that killed a driver and 27 spectators necessitated the use of a new circuit, the Florio circuit being used between 1935 and 1937, and it's a layout you might have driven if you've played the cult classic racing game, Spirit of Speed. Then during the war, it was left to the elements, being refurbished in 1948, just in time for Grand Prix racing to resume in Europe, and also just in time for the Formula One World Championship to visit in 1950. But the 1950 layout was slightly different to what we know today. Parabolica was two 90 degree right handers which didn't become the corner we know until 1954 when the circuit was completely revamped. So now, the circuit totaled 3.5 miles for the road course and 2.6 miles for the oval that could still be combined for a total 6.1 mile speedathon. Now the idea for this race came about because the president of the Automobile Club of Italy, a man called Giuseppe Bacchi... what is it? Back a... This guy had the president of the United States Auto Club, or USAC, Dwayne Carter, over for dinner during the 1956 Italian Grand Prix. And while they were having dinner, the two got talking, and the conversation, I'm assuming, went something along the lines of, hey, wouldn't it be cool if your guys came over here and raced on our oval? Your guys, our guys, Indy, F1, here, it'd be fun. And the anoraks among you will already be going, but this was already happening just the other way around, and you would be right, as up until 1960 the Indianapolis 500 was a round of the Formula 1 World Championship, and this is the reason why there's a few American drivers on the all-time winner list in Formula 1 right down at the bottom with a single win. But even though it was a round of the Formula 1 World Championship, the F1 teams tended to avoid the Indy 500, whether that was because they couldn't be bothered to develop a car for just one race, they just couldn't be bothered in general, or they wanted to concentrate on other events in Europe, or just concentrate on Formula 1, the list goes on, there's probably a myriad of reasons. But while they didn't tend to race in the 1950s, they would tend to race in the 1960s. Drivers like Jim Clark and Graham Hill and Jack Brabham and Jackie Stewart, among others, decided to give it a go in the 60s, when it wasn't part of the Formula 1 World Championship. The main point of this conversation between Mr Giuseppe and Duane was how close the Indianapolis Motor Speedway and the Monza Oval were, even though they weren't. The Monza Oval was longer and had 30 degree banking versus Indy's 9.2 degree banking, but apart from that, 
they were very, very similar. But the question still remained. IndyCar versus Formula One. F1 stars against Indy stars. Guys like Bill Vukovic versus Sterling Moss. A little bit of banter between the Euros and the Yanks. Just a bit of fun. So the event was arranged to take place in the June of 1957 and 10 of America's finest oval racing teams brought their cars over to Italy and the whole event, predictably, was going to be run to Indy 500 engine rules. So teams could run either a 2.8 litre supercharged engine or a 4.2 litre naturally aspirated engine. The race would be three heats of 63 laps, totaling a rough 500 miles, which led to the event being quite creatively called Monzanapolis. However, there were a couple of problems. While there were a few European teams trying to enter the race, only two of those entries were Formula 1 teams. Mario Bonigia entered a customer Ferrari while Maserati sent one of their factory drivers. The rest of the F1 teams had basically said a flat out no to the whole idea, as their cars were not built to handle taking the banking for that long and the suspension was not compatible with the Indy spec tyres and vice versa. There was also the International Union of Professional Pilots, later called the GPDA, which basically told these drivers, yeah, if you crash and die, there's nothing we can do about it. But despite the lack of Formula 1 entries, other cars were entered. Jaguar turned up with three D-types that were run by the Acuria Cos team. Not Formula 1 cars, but were entered to give the Americans enough of a reason to look over their shoulders. Because these cars were tuned to go very, very fast in a straight line. They weren't Formula 1 cars. These were cars that had run at Le Mans. These were cars that had won Le Mans the previous weekend. But even then, the American teams were used to this sort of racing, and to the surprise of nobody, they ran away with it. The USAC cars were nudging 170 miles an hour, which at the time was about 30 more miles an hour than they'd ever get at Indianapolis. And while the Jags were off the pace, finishing as much as three laps down on the USAC cars in front of them, they were reliable and they finished all three heats, while a lot of the USAC cars dropped out. Meaning that just by staying alive, the Jags had finished well, and having the overall results to hand would have been nice, Wikipedia. Making me do some actual work here. Jimmy Bryan was declared the overall winner, as he was the only man to finish all 189 laps, and with that win came $35,000 in prize money. And at the same time, with an average lap speed of around 160 miles an hour or 257 kilometers over the three heats, it was, at the time, the fastest race ever held. So the first event was a success. So you know what that means. They're going to do another one 12 months later. And because there was a lot of prize money on offer, the Formula 1 team suddenly decided that they were going to enter. And even Enzo Ferrari decided he was going to enter a team. But only because the Automobile Club of Italy paid out a cash prize to the most successful Italian constructor in Formula 1, and they told Enzo that if he wanted to win that cash prize, he had to enter the Race of Two Worlds to be eligible. The 1958 entry list had a few more names that you'd recognise, names such as Moss, Fanjo, Hawthorne, Phil Hill and AJ Foyt, with Fanjo participating in a USAC car and going out on a wet track setting lap speeds in practice in the 145 mile an hour range. I'm surprised the car could hit those kinds of speeds considering the testicular fortitude required to do such a thing. The Ferraris were modified Formula 1 cars, the 412 MI, specifically tuned to run this one race and accommodate the massive V12 in the front, a V12 that was previously used to run the Mil Miglia the year before and was the fastest of the European cars in practice. But in the actual heat, it was Sterling Moss's purpose-built Maserati that was the fastest of the European cars, finishing fourth behind Jim Rathman, Jimmy Bryan and Bob Veith, a lap down on the winner. Jaguar had returned but they were well off the pace, so it was Maserati and Ferrari trying to keep up with the Americans. In Heat 2, only 13 of the 14 finishes from Heat 1 took part, where Jim Rathman won again with Moss fifth this time round, and the Ferrari of Musso and Hill finishing down in ninth. The 11 cars that would finish the second heat would start the third. Now Rathman predictably won heat 3 and the overall race, but remarkably a Ferrari was able to finish in third with the combined efforts of Phil Hill and Mike Hawthorne. Just 6 drivers finished that final heat, but the Ferrari in third place was as good as it got for Europe, because Fangio's car failed on lap 2 and Moss crashed when his steering failed, which must have been scary as all hell. 
and Hawthorne, who was actually unwell at the time, was suffering from inhaling the methanol fumes, and that was also a part of the reason he had to hand over the car to Hill. The crowd for the 1958 race was massive. It was bigger than the previous year, and the likes of people like Moss and Fanjo and Hill and Foyt turning up probably contributed to that. But while it was very popular, it was an absolute sinkhole for many, and the Automobile Club of Italy decided not to fund a third race. So if the Europeans wanted to take on the Americans in a race on an oval, it was back to having a crack at Indianapolis, and it wouldn't be until 1965 that a European would triumph again at the famous oval, with Jim Clark winning in 1965 and Graham Hill as a rookie winning the year after. With the last European to win the Indy 500 being quite recent, 2019, with Simon Pagano. The Monza Oval was last used in a competitive road race in 1969, nice, and since then it has been left to decay, whilst also being threatened with flat out demolition several times. But it was used for the Monza Rally last year, but other than that, the Oval serves as a place for drivers to get their Instagram shots trying to climb the banking, whilst also being a place where you can sit and hear the ghosts of the past fly by in their pre-war machinery. So then, a look at the time Formula 1 and IndyCar went toe-to-toe -to -toe on the Monza Oval. If this has been something new for you, be sure to like the video so it does the algorithmy stuff. And if you're not subscribed, why not get subscribed and also get that bell on so you never miss out on one of my future videos. Massive thanks as ever to the rad lads of Patreon, and if you want to support this channel at a more personal level so I can buy and use photos and stuff like that, especially with the new cars coming out this year for F1, the pressing issues stuff, and also get some historical stuff together, then you can help by following the link in the description, where there'll also be a link to the Goodwood article on this race, along with some pictures you can look at, and also links to Discord and to my socials. So until next time, I've been Aidan Millward, have a great day wherever you live in the world, and I'll see you all again soon for another video. Bye. Thank you.